a little reverb. Is this one on by chance? Perfect. Thank you. Welcome to worship this morning. We are pleased that you have gathered with us this day as we celebrate and remember the Reformation Sunday. And no matter where you are, if you are here with us together virtually, God is always present with us. And happy Reformation Sunday, Lutherans. Today's worship will be interspersed with these reflections on the Lutheran worship service and the ways that Martin Luther's fingerprints still remain. Our Lutheran heritage traces its roots back to the 16th century and a tumultuous time in the church, a time which has come to be called the Reformation. As we worship this morning, we hear the echoes of Martin Luther's solas. Sola is a Latin word that means only. Out of the Reformation came three solas, sola scriptura, sola gratra, and sola fide. Translated to English, word alone, grace alone, and faith alone. These three phrases are above the original doors of our church building. On your way out the front doors today, be sure to look back and look up and just below and a little to the side of that large canvas of Jesus, and you will see those words that ground our Lutheran tradition. One of Luther's great gifts to the church was his love of music. But in the early 16th century, most church music was chant-like and performed exclusively by the monks, not the whole congregation. Luther, however, felt that the worshipers should be involved in songs and praise, so he set about taking familiar tunes that people already knew and putting words of faith to the music. Interestingly, some of Luther's hymns have been sung now for centuries were based on tunes that people might have sung in the local pubs while enjoying a pint of beer. Before we join our voices together in our opening hymn, let us just close our eyes for a moment to gently breathe in and to breathe out. Prepare our hearts for the Holy Spirit to enter in. I invite you to rise in body or spirit.
In our opening words of faith today, the prophet Jeremiah foretells a new covenant which the Lord will make with his people. Martin Luther used this new covenant kind of language, most especially in seeking to understand what it means to be baptized, how we are brought into a new covenant or a new relationship with Christ through the simplicity of water in the power of God's word. Even though we do not have a baptism this morning, our worship begins here at the baptismal font as we remember how God has made us his people, his children, and how God has inscribed his promises on our hearts. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people. I will, I will put, put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer will they teach one another to say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, form the least of them to the greatest. For, for I, I will forgive, forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Normally, we would stand for the confession and forgiveness, but a long-standing tradition has been to kneel for this part of worship. And many churches have kneelers just for this purpose of assuming a posture of penitence, a recognition of our sinfulness as we approach the presence of God. For Martin Luther, the opportunity to confess our sins and then to the hear the words of forgiveness was so profound that it was something that should be right up front when believers gather a starting point of worship. And for Luther, this act of confession did not have to be private for only a priest to hear. For him, it was like coming into a welcoming room, taking off a heavy coat, and getting settled in, getting rid of all of those burdens and weighty sins so that you could hear the scriptures more clearly and, the sign, and sing the songs more joyfully. As we sing our solo gratia hymn, our grace alone hymn this morning, you have an opportunity to come and kneel at the altars, either the upper or the lower, Bring your bulletin with you and take off that heavy coat, either by sitting in your seats or coming forward to kneel. Hear the good news of forgiveness. And here we will speak the words of confession together. I invite you to either be seated or to come forward and kneel. But 
but now am found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Amen. And let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power and forgiveness. source of all life. We confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by love willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cries and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional. And we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord has promised good. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. The next section of worship is the heart of the liturgy. Liturgy, which literally means the work of the people. It is important to note that the greeting we have just said, the Kyrie and the hymn of praise, the feast, uh, this is the feast we are, we're all standard parts of the Latin Mass. Were you to go to a Catholic worship service today, you will find this same sequence of the liturgy, the greeting, which offers biblical word of welcome to one another, the Kyrie, which is the repetition of the, the prayer, Lord, have mercy, followed by a joyful song of praise, which announces Christ's love for the world. You see, Martin Luther loved rhythm, the order, and the underlying theology of the Latin Mass, and he wanted to retain all of that. But there was one thing he wanted to change. 
the Latin part. The problem for worshipers was that everything was sung and spoken in Latin, so Luther translated the language of worship to the language of the people to their native German so that they could fully participate in the real meaning, in the real meaning of the word liturgy, the work of the people. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing and listen for Luther's fingerprints. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. People of God, let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. 
and bestow on the church your saving grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I'm going to be inviting forward the families of our two-year-olds to receive their Spark Story Bibles this morning. And when uh, parents, you come up, uh, their Bibles is over here with a bull, uh, bookmark that has their name on it. I invite you then to have a seat up front and then their littles to come and join me at the step. So the families of Amelia Dahl, Wyatt Goldberg, Audrey Husso, Bryn Jarko, and Riley Johnson. I invite you to come forward. If you'll grab Amelia's Bible. And Amelia, you come join me over here today. Will you come sit with me? Thank you. Can you come sit? Yeah, come sit up here. Oh, you hold on to that for just a little bit, okay? All right, because I want to show you some of the fun things that are going to be in your new Bibles. Oh my goodness, what do you see on this page? What are those? Animals, Animals like giraffes and rhinos and lions and monkeys. Oh my. This is a story about Noah's Ark where all the animals would go on the big boat. Here's another one. Oh boy, do you think he's happy or sad? Does he look happy or sad? Happy. Really, really happy, doesn't he? Yes, and he's so happy because God spoke to him and he knows how to be one of God's children. Let's look at this one. Oh. <laughs> look at this picture, wow. That's a giant, isn't it? And that giant has this little boy that's sitting over here. His name is David, and the giant's name is Goliath. And something not good happened to the giant, but you'll have to read the story to find out. Oh, maybe we know who this is. Who's that? Who's that, Audrey? Do you know? Who's this? Who is it? Who is that? There's cows, and there's shepherds, and Mary, and Joseph, and baby Jesus, right? Yes, it's baby Jesus. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, boy. What's that man eating? What's that man eating? Is that a bug? Yeah. It's a grasshopper. This is John the Baptist. He was kind of silly. He ate bugs. We don't eat bugs, do we? No. But look at this one. Oh, boy. They're out in a boat, and look how big that wave is. Look how big it is. It's a storm. But Jesus is in the boat sleeping, isn't he? Do you see his eyes are closed? Yes, they are. There are just so many marvelous pictures and stories in your new Bibles that you are going to receive. So can you find your moms and dads and stand up with them and they can have a prayer over you? Can you find mom and dad and tell them, come and join me? Yeah? Martin Luther advocated for the teaching of all children of all ages. So parents, even though your littles cannot quite read those books themselves, they have the capacity to know and to love God and to know the love of their parents and the joy of the connection of that love to the stories that you get to read to each other and with each other. So we encourage you to treasure that Bible story time often. Can we pray? Can we pray? Let us pray. Loving God, you have been given these, us these Bibles for our learning more about you and the stories that you want us to learn. Grant that we may hear them, read them, and listen for your promises. Through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thanks for coming up, friends.
for Martin Luther, for the reformers, and for, yes, us too. The biblical word stands at the center of worship. It is sola scriptura, word alone. It is critical for worship and critical, sorry, critical for the lives of our believers. No worship service is complete without hearing God's word. Martin Luther translated the scriptures into the German language because he wanted God's word in the hands of the people. He was convinced that you didn't need a priest or a religious scholar to read and study God's word. This was a gift everyone could open and use. The Bible, Luther would say, was the cradle where you would find Christ. Reading the Bible should be like hearing your mother's voice speaking to you. Let us read responsibly Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depth of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make that city of God. God in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of the day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord. Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still, then, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Sorry. Now we will know the reading from the book of Romans in the third chapter. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human being makes themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into the right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is an act of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ beginning with the 19 verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human beings will be justified in his sight by deeds apart from law. The righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift, though the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith, he did this to show his righteousness because it is divine forbearance he has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by law. Word of God, word of life.
the Holy Gospel according to John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin, beginning the 31st verse. When Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Today is Reformation Sunday, an opportunity to consider the life, faith, and ministry of Martin Luther. He was born in 1483 and is most remembered for how he took a stand against the Roman Catholic Church and wanted to see the church rediscover the power of God's word and be reformed by the wonderful news of God's grace. Some say Martin Luther was a hot-tempered big mouth who always needed to have his say, but others say he was a kind man who loved music and was gentle in his style of persuasion and encouragement. I guess we'll never know for sure but we can be certain that his faith and love for God made a tremendous impact for all ages. Well, well, I can tell you all about him. More than I am sure you care to even know. Uh, who are you? How, how did you get up here? Well, you said you wanted to know what Martin Luther was really like, so I thought I would just come and give you an earful, as Martin himself would often say. Although I used to say more like a belly full because wherever Martin was, there was always food, which meant that I was close at hand too. Wait a minute. Are you who I think you are? Are you Katie Luther, Martin's wife? Catherine Von Bora Luther, to be exact. But Martin liked to call me his favorite rib. I guess it had something to do with Adam and Eve, but I never got it. There were a lot of Martin's jokes that I did not get, but I loved to laugh with him all the same. Well, this is amazing. What a wonderful treat to have you here on Reformation Sunday of all Sundays. Uh, would you sit down and talk for a little bit? Thank you. I don't mind if I do. I like to set the record straight. My poor Martin Luther was often misunderstood, and his message of God's grace still gets sidetracked and watered down. Hmm. That's interesting. What, what do you mean? Well, perhaps my favorite book by Martin was called The Freedom of the Christian. Yet, I not only read his books, I was, I think what you would call it today, his proofreader. Poor Martin was a lousy speller. But in that book, he said, a Christian is perfectly free, subject to none. God's grace has set us free once and for all. And yet, because of that freedom, we now live in Christ and through Christ. We are servants to all and are Christ to one another. But the reason we should serve one another and God is not to get some reward or be sure to get into heaven but simply because we are free to love, and love makes us want and desire to do God's will. That's uh, some pretty good preaching there, Katie. Do you mind if I call you Katie? That, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so did you help Martin with any of his uh, sermons and his teachings? Not really, but you have to understand his classroom and church office were really our home's dining room. Every night there was this plenty of guests for dinner, and God only knows how we fed all of those mouths, plus our own six children. But I was always invited to add my opinion, and you better believe that I did. 
I guess that is why Martin always liked to refer to me as his own theologian and said that my words were like a brilliant light. So we've often heard versions about how you met and were married, <laughs> something about rescuing you from a convent and something about fish barrels. I must admit, probably all that you have heard is true. It sounds like a fairy tale, but in fact, it is all true. You see, when I was only five years old, my mother died, and I was sent to live in a convent for schooling. By age 10, the other nuns, well, they decided that I was going to become a nun too. I was only 16 when I took my vows, and I hardly knew what I was doing, but I expected to live my whole life right there in the convent. The one positive thing that came out of my time there was that I learned to read, which was not a thing that happened for most women in that day. Then a few of the other nuns, myself included, we got our hands on the works of this fellow named Luther. We were deeply moved by his words and needed to hear more. We began to wonder if God meant a different life for us. So here is where those fish barrels came in. <laughs> there were 12 of us at all, in all. One of the nun's father delivered fish herring, to be exact, in big barrels to the convent. He was a big supporter of the Reformation and Martin knew Martin quite well. So on Easter Eve in 1523, he dropped off those barrels for the festival. Then later, when he came to pick them back up, we were all hidden inside of them. Boy, was that stinky. <laughs> but it was well worth our freedom. You see, the ruler in our area was against Luther and made it le illegal for people to leave a convent or a monastery to follow him. So that is why we had to escape in such a sneaky, secret way. Well, we ended up right there on Luther's doorstep. <laughs> Boy, was he surprised to have to find homes for 12 women. He worked long and hard to find them eligible bachelors, all except for me. For some reason, he always had an excuse. So I stayed at another professor's home a little ways away for a, quite a while, and he had to know that I had eyes for him, but he sure did not let on. <laughs> it was not until the king of Denmark came for a visit and was quite taken by my <clears throat> charm and attractive nature. The very next day, Martin appeared out of nowhere. He kept talking about how he might not live long, so that his wife is reluctant to take a wife and that he knew that many would misunderstand if he did. He rambled on and on, and I finally said, that's okay, I'll marry the king of Denmark, to which he boomed, heaven forbid. We were betrothed the next day and married only two weeks later. <laughs> That really is a fairy tale story. Did you guys live happily ever after? It was quite a challenge going from the solitary life in the convent to a whole household of people to cook for, but I really loved it. The whole marriage thing, well, it took a little while to work out. Martin seemed to think he could tackle it like any other theological problem. Through humor and grace, he eventually learned that you solve a marriage not by great thoughts, but by love. Funny, he knew so much about God's love, but it took him quite a while to know and to understand the love of a wife. But we went through a lot together. I can, I can imagine. What were some of the biggest challenges? For me, it was losing one daughter as an infant, and then worse, losing our Magdalena at age 13. I do not think that either of us ever got over the pain and the grief, and it certainly tested our faith in God. But Martin liked to say, God's grace surprises us every day with renewed strength and hope to keep on living. <laughs> that sure puts grace in a practical sense. It's something to be experienced and practiced versus some nice theological tenant. You can say that again. Just like I told Martin over and over again, 
you have to practice what you preach. Well, I better get going here. Time travel is no piece of strudel, you know. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for choosing our church to visit this Reformation Sunday. I hope, I hope you come back and visit us soon. God's grace and peace be with you. Well, same to all of you good folks. And remember my favorite state saying, stick to Christ as a burr on sticks to a top coat, and all will be well. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord and farewell, friends. Thanks be to God for the life and ministry of both Martin and Katie Luther.
the Lutheran Church, which emerged from the 16th century Reformation, has been called a confessing church. This, of course, is partly because of what we publicly did at the beginning of worship. We confessed our sins. But even more, we are a confessing church because our emph emphasis on some important creedal statements that contain the essential declarations of our Christian faith. The Apostles' Creed is one such confession, a public confession of what we believe, and we use the memorable words of the Apostles' Creed week in and week out in worship. Have you ever thought that if someone asked you what you believe about God, you could simply speak the Apostles' Creed to them? Through regular repetition for most Lutherans, these words are deeply embedded in one's memory. There is also certainly a part of Luther's sola fide, belief in faith alone guiding us. Sometimes we hear those words through spoken word, but also through sung word. We begin our time of professing and confessing our faith by singing the first verse of Jesus loves me twice. And then today, however, we are going to let you rely on your memory for the Apostles' Creed and instead speak together what Martin Luther wrote in the small catechism as the explanation for the third part of the creed where we confess, I believe, in the Holy Spirit. Our Mission Possible students have been learning actions to the first verse and refrain of Jesus loves me. I invite them to come forward to lead all of us in singing Jesus loves me this morning. So please come forward, children. Let's gather in this middle section here so everyone can see your faces. Are you ready? Okay. Yep, come on, sneak in, everybody. Yep. Perfect. Make sure you have enough room for your arms, right? Make sure you have enough room. Perfect. All right. Ready?
invite you to rise in body or spirit as we join our voices together in Luther's explanation of the third article. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Luther writes. I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me through the one true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church today, Day after day, we fully, he fully forgives our sins and sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and you and all the dead and give us and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. And let us pray. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. We pray for your holy church in every place and for those who serve the following, the example of Christ, especially Kit, who is journeying through seminary. Help all students on track to word and serve and word and sacrament, sacrament to live by faith and walk by the light of your gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For parts of the world ravaged by natural disasters, relieve those affected by the aftermath of flooding. Keep our farmers in health and hope as they finish the harvest season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For victims of violence, give peace. For those struggling with addiction, bring hope. Give patience for those undergoing medical testing. Restore those who are healing from medical procedures. For all who are sick, especially the names that we have been entrusted to pray for, Grant, Terry, and Lloyd, Ray, Jeff, and Ron, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving that you have abolished death, and for the saints who have died, especially Allison's great-grandmother, Deanne, and Mike's brother, Nick, bring us all eternal life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Please share the Lord's peace with one another. I invite you to remain standing because I'm just going to have you stand back up. Oh, actually, you can be seated. We have offering in between. <laughs> so much fun stuff today. Uh, equipping Roadshow, there's some information in your bulletin. Um, the times are listed there this week. They were missing last week. If you need help registering, just let me know today. Um, there is a little sheet in the back that tells you about the different workshops. It is this coming Saturday at uh, First Lutheran in Marshall. So we hope that uh, as many of us that are able to will come. Also, I know it listed in the bulletin that Mission Possible this week is Service Project Night. We've actually swapped Game Night and Service Project Night, so if you're a Game Night helper, typically, we're going to ask that you come this Wednesday instead of a week out. Thank you so much for your generosity, the ways that you serve and you care for those in our community and around the world. At this time, the ushers will receive the Lord's offering.
God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to help all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Amen. Lutheran worship is a service of word and sacrament. In fact, in many ways, the whole service points toward the opportunity for God's people to finally and actively respond to the invitation of Jesus to come and receive the real presence of Christ. When Martin Luther was first called on as a Catholic priest to preside over Holy Communion, he was so overcome with his own sinfulness and so frightened of handling the body and the blood of Christ that he messed up the words and he spilled some of the wine. What Luther eventually came to understand, however, as central to our Lutheran theology, was that the bread and the wine did not somehow magically become the actual body and blood of Jesus, but rather in the giving and the receiving of the bread and wine. Together with the words, for you, Christ becomes truly present. In this meal, we touch and we taste the mysterious wonder of God's gift of his Son. Let us join our voices together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. The body of Christ is for you. The blood of Christ is for you. I invite you to be seated and the ushers will direct you forward. body of Christ given for you.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds of sin and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. So today we have not only worshipped, but we have looked at worship itself. The Lutheran service of word and sacrament. And through this repeated worship formula, we continue to do what believers for the last 500 plus years have done. We come each week to hear God's loving word for our lives and to share in the promises of the Lord's Supper. Now we have heard the benediction, those sending words. We go now out praising God and singing, ready to live as servants of Christ in the world, as proclaimers of the good news to all who will hear. And we sing. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 